Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with Ian McCormack, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Now, we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet today, and we are bringing you the letter O, which stands for Ontario. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by the president of the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario. But first, we'll be digging into a story out of Winnipeg about ethics. Then we'll be off to Nova Scotia to talk about the province asking municipalities to form police boards, which some municipalities are not doing. And then we'll be ending in Ontario to discuss a recent council meeting in Guelph, which residents came out to voice their concerns about the strong mayor powers. But first, as always, Ian, how are you? I'm doing well. It's summertime. All's good. Stories keep happening. Municipal government doesn't seem to take a rest. It certainly doesn't. And we will be starting off in Winnipeg, where a city councillor recently told the media that at no time did he attempt to stall a housing development in the city. Last week, a judge awarded a developer $5 million for a lawsuit he brought against the city and planning officials. The councillor said that the suggestion he pressured the planners is false and he was shocked by the comments laid out in the 92-page judicial report. The councillor said that while he had concerns about aspects of the development, he never directed anyone to slow it down. It should be noted that the councillor was not named in the lawsuit against the city, but was mentioned in the report. Ian, how do council members walk a fine line about wanting more information and a presumption of crossing an ethical line. There's, I think this is really a tough one, particularly for people who are new to local government. Existing councillors have probably seen it once before, mayors, same sort of thing. I actually don't know whether this council was first term or not. There are procedures in place for this, which are supposed to provide what they say is transparency and fairness and openness and accountability and all that stuff to both parties, in this case, a, a developer. Uh, but the municipal government in order on behalf of the uh, residents of the community, the wider community and the, and the specific community fall in here too. So in this case, even a false word, loose lips sink ships is kind of the thing I was thinking about as I was looking at this, that these local government folk do have, and large communities like this one, certainly have access to legal minds who can advise them on things. And procedurally, once a conversation has wrapped up, those off the cuff remarks can be used to do things like appeals or launch lawsuits or in this sort of a process can be used against the uh, the staff who have been named here uh, and oddly against the uh, the municipal government official the councillor in this case who wasn't as you said wasn't named in this suit so it's difficult and it reads a little bit like throwing somebody under the under the bus a little bit on this one as well so how do how should councillors walk that line because off the cuff yeah. remarks, and I am not speaking out of turn here, Ian, but they happen all the time. Uh, I've been in around council meetings where people say things off the cuff and it comes back and bites them in the butt. So how do councillors and mayors and elected officials walk that fine line of being true to themselves, but also knowing that what they say now could potentially be held against them in the court of law? Yeah. So not only is it the, the content of the comment, it's the timing of the comment as well. People have opinions, elected officials have opinions, citizens have opinions, everybody has the right to express those, of course. There is a bit of an onus or responsibility that falls on these local government officials that whether they like it or not, they're often speaking or perceived anyway as speaking on behalf of the council or about the municipality. And so words can have some impact where me as a private citizen could say the same thing and nobody would really pay attention to it. The other part to it is I mentioned is timing as well. If this is a com comment that a uh, a councillor may have made uh, may, uh, either supposing to provide some direction to members of, of administration or just like you, we've been saying off the cuff, that's one thing. But if it's said after a council decision has been made, say, uh, then it kind of shines a light into the process and may be perceived as, as bias. Uh, I would say too that the, the, the ideal thing is to close the barn doors before the horses think about leaving. 
And part of that falls into orientations, ongoing professional development and training, a caution from administration as part of a request for decision or part of a briefing note. Those kind of things can be done in an antecedent way, as can conversations with uh, previous elected officials or even more experienced elected officials around council too. So those kind of things do exist there and local government, any order of government probably is not just like working in the private sector or being a member of the public anymore. Some Nova Scotia municipalities are forming police boards after urging from the provincial justice minister, but others are saying they won't unless ordered to do so. Now, the region of Queens has moved ahead with starting a seven-person RCMP advisory board after years of using their elected council to receive updates from the RCMP. In a CTV News article, Mayor Darlene Norman is quoted, we've never had one and we should have one. Under the Provincial Police Act, all municipalities must have either a board of police commissioners if they use a municipal police force or an advisory board if they use the RCMP. But Warden Vernon Pitts of the District of Guysboro said that their councillor council recently talked about the issue and decided to keep a council committee overseeing the RCMP. He is quoted in the same article as saying, we advise the minister that this is the way we do it. It's been working so far to date. There's nothing wrong with it. And we have no intention of fixing it unless ordered to do so, end quote. So Ian, when a province asks municipalities to do something, is it just an ask or is there much more than just the ask? I suppose in a legislative sense, it's a sense if it's permissive or prescriptive. If it's prescriptive and a thou shalt, it's more than an ask, it's a requirement. If it's should, shall, may, uh, the, the municipality can take its pick. Of course, it happens different ways in different provinces because uh, municipal government is set up across the country in a slightly different fashion, province by province, territory by territory. The going against a provincial statute of one form or another, if it's requiring some sort of action to a municipal government, is can be certainly seen as a... As, a threat that's open to some sort of a retribution from the province through the legal system. But if it's permissive, then it becomes more of a conversation, an argument, a debate. One of the interesting things I found, you mentioned uh, Warden Pitts from Guysborough, who said that they, they're just going to use continue to use counsel. And the reason he said that was we are citizens, we are members of the public. So we are able to provide our comment to, based on policing oversight. And police is, if not unique, then close to it in that it's it's paramilitary in many, many places. And we tacitly or explicitly give the police the, the ability to use force over us and restrict our freedoms. So it's a little bit different, say, than a recreation program or a street sweeper and in, in that we do this. So the oversight makes sense, particularly when it's a federal, federal or national body like the RCMP, where we certainly can't regulate them locally, although local governments can augment their RCMP uh, if they want to by paying extra. We can get back into the RCMP back payments if you want to, but that's a whole different topic. Uh, and, but if you have a, police, a municipal police force, most major cities do, and a lot of smaller communities do as well, then it's that group of citizens which needs to provide oversight because they have delegated the authority for, um, uh, for minding their, or keeping order in the community to that group. So it's necessary to have some sort of oversight, whether it's council or whether it's a, an individual, sorry, a group of citizens. I, councils are busy. So I was a little surprised to hear a member of a council say, we got it. Okay. Now, I want to get your opinion on this, because when I read this story, the warden's comments clicked into a statement that I heard from numerous councillors when I was working and covering politics in Northern Ontario. And the warden's comments come close to one of the worst answers you can give in politics. And the question is always, why do we do this this way? And the answer and the worst answer you could ever give a politician is, well, because we've always done it that way. Is this not just the sort of digging your heels into the trench here and saying, we've done it this way. It works good. There's no reason to change it. And even if there's a better way, we can do it we're still going to keep it the way that we've done it for many years. You're suggesting it's never about what it's about. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> so there may be more to this story than, than what appears on the surface here. And there may be some conflict or historical something that's been going on between the, the municipality and the, the whatever oversight body or the province. Somebody's trying to make a point. I don't I don't really know anything beyond what's what's in writing. But yeah, your point is a valid one. And finally, in Ontario, the City of Guelph Council got an earful from residents after the province announced that it was one of the 26 new municipalities that would be getting strong mayor powers in the province. Delegates lined up to raise their concerns for the strong mayor powers announced by the provincial government. One delegate is quoted as saying, please put everything into effect that you can to protect the democracy of this chamber, end quote. The legislation gives mayors the ability to veto bylaws that conflict with provincial priorities like building more houses. Another delegate is quoted as saying, sadly, some of the more toxic and undemocratic aspects of the Strong Mayors Act still exist. For example, housing bylaws passed with a minority of votes, end quote. Many of the delegates asked that notices be given to the public if and when the power is going to be used. Ian, municipalities in Ontario are getting these so-called strong mayor powers and could possibly see more residents voicing their concerns about them. Should mayors be cautious about using these powers as we see a rise in the pushback against them, like what is happening in the city of Guelph? So I, some member mayors have said I'll use them. Some mayors have said I won't use them. It seems to be either cultural or individual rather than anything that is systemic or anything that's been recommended from another body. So sure, anytime the rules are changed from above, I would be a little bit cautious about it. The, the, the oddity to me about these strong mayor powers are the mayor, uh, as long as you, and you made reference to it during your introduction, as, as long as something is in alignment with provincial priorities, the mayor can make a decision. But what if a mayor decides something is against provincial priorities, as we may well see now in Toronto, of course, with the change uh, th uh, there at the top. So if the, if the powers are in a municipal act, they have, the act has to be followed. If they are, again, prescriptive, they have to be followed. If they're permissive, they don't necessarily. There's a bit of a reminder here, too, or an echo of things like the 15-minute city, wherein people are getting exercised about an issue that may or may not have any, any reality that's going to change anything, or without a really deep and good understanding of what these changes might be and what, change, what effect they might have in the community as well. Who knows? It might be much about nothing. It might be something really significant, and that might vary from community to community. But people who are lined up here are probably fairly universal in saying you shouldn't be using these strong mayor powers, even if they don't necessarily know what those strong mayor powers will have will do in terms of impact on city governance and the services that they provide. You just mentioned uh, the, uh, the city of Toronto, and I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, the province announced these strong mayor powers to sort of align themselves with what the municipalities were doing. So if the municipal mayor didn't think that it, uh, a decision aligned with the province, they could veto it, overturn it, so on and so forth. When you have two conflicting sort of political allegiances where the municipality is leaning one way, the province is leaning the other, could this spell uh, not disaster, but some gray area for mayors to take liberties on what they believe is in alignment with the provincial governments? Certainly. There is there is factually there is a legislative paramountcy too. It says the higher order legislation will hold um, and it will declare a lower order legislation that, conf that conflicts with it, null and void, at least to the point of the uh, the conflict. So the, the constitution overrides everything, federal statute, provincial statute, bylaws, policies, and on down the line. So as, if the municipalities have to abide by provincial statute, beyond that, they can create their own bylaws and their own policies and carry them out as long as they don't conflict uh, with the higher order legislation. Where it comes into play a little bit is how those things are exercised, carried out. And the way the legislation appears to be intended is for municipal governments to partner, be partners of the province and carrying out provincial wishes in terms of their social programs, housing in particular. And then if the, if the alignment is there, nobody has any issues with it. But if, um, if a city in this case, because it's all cities, I think, which have been given these powers, 
if the city mayor runs up against, philosophically up against the minister or the premier, then sure, I can see a point of conflict there. If essentially the lower order government, I don't like order uh, lower or higher very much, but the lower order government isn't doing what the higher order wants it to do. Ultimately, of course, the province could change the rules, you know, change the regulation, uh, change the act again to come into some sort of an alignment, whether it's about this particular topic or any other topic that deals with the powers that a council or a municipality has. It's going to be interesting to talk to Stephen O'Brien, the president of the Association of Municipal Managers, about this question as well, because uh, we always talk about what the mayor gets to do, but what the mayor has in his powers and or their powers and responsibilities also affects the administration as well. So it's going to be interesting to hear from him how the AMCTO is dealing with the strong mayor powers, particularly after the new announcement of 26 new uh, municipalities. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree with you. So with that, we'll be right back after a quick break with our interview with Stephen O'Brien, the president of the Association of Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario. Welcome to O is for Ontario on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Today, we are honoured to have Stephen O'Brien president of the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario. He is also the city clerk for the city of Guelph, Ontario. Now, the association represents excellence in local government management and leadership. Over the past 85 years, they have provided education, accreditation, leadership, and management expertise for Ontario municipal professionals. Their mission is to deliver professional growth, networks, advocacy, and leadership to support and strengthen the knowledge, skills, and capabilities of municipal professionals now and into the future. Now, today, we are going to be chatting about the state of municipalities and administrations in the province. So, Stephen, welcome to the Political Trenches, and I want to get the chat underway with my first question. In your opinion, as president of the A, I uh, just want to make sure I get this right here again, the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks, and Treasurers of Ontario, what is the state of municipal administrations in the province of Ontario today? Well, thanks for having me, Chris. It's really great to be here. Um, you know, from AMCTO's perspective, you know, we see the state of, of local government and municipal administration in a, in a really positive space right now. There is certainly a lot of change happening in our sector. Uh, it is hyper dynamic. There is no doubt about that. We're seeing legislative change. We're seeing regulatory change. We're seeing all the things that I think local governments have to deal with. Uh, across obviously Ontario, across Canada, into the U.S., and, and perhaps probably even around the world. Um, but you know, from AMCTO's perspective, we see that that local government working in municipal uh, administration is a great place to be. It's a great place to work. You know, lots of offerings in terms of dynamic roles. Again, talking about the dynamic sector that we're in, but lots of dynamic roles, lots of uh, responsibilities that staff coming into our sector uh, can sort of get their get their hands dirty in um, and roll up their sleeves. And and I think a lot of it too is is it, there's a passion among certainly our members to serve the local communities that they that they work in and they support. So um, AMC has got a really good place. Our our role is to really um, you know. Uh, impress upon folks that local government is a career pathway of choice for uh, new graduates, students, um, you know, you know, see, more seasoned professionals that, that may have had a career path in other areas. So, um, yeah, I, you know, in terms of the state of municipal administration in Ontario, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to work if you're looking for that dynamic, you know, never a dull <laughs> moment kind of kind of role. So are you noticing that the speed of change itself is speeding up that things are changing more rapidly that they than they used to and whether that whether you it's easier or harder to adapt than maybe it used to be a decade ago yeah i i, I think certainly it is it, it feels like that way uh, i don't know if that's because i myself have moved through a career path into sort of progressively senior roles uh and so then you get sort of you you you're, you find yourself landing in that crucible of of kind of change and constant dynamic i i don't know if it's that but you know anecdotally yes i think we're in a in a in a place where the pace of change has increased across the board. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't love looking back at the last five years for obvious reasons, because we all <laughs> globally went through a pretty uh, upside down topsy turvy time. Um, but, but in addition to a pandemic, you think about global conflict on a scale that I don't think we've seen in, since, you know, maybe early nineties, late nineties, mm -hmm. Iraq conflict and things like that. Um, you know, uh, we're seeing it just even at our local level, 
a lot of change in Ontario around reviews of regional government, um, you know, the introduction of strong mayor authority, which, which, is, which is, is positive in many ways, but in, in other ways, it's, it's challenging the norms we have. And as an association, we're keen to stand up and say, you know, having, a, a, you know, an unbiased, uh, you know, administrative side of the organization that is there in perpetuity to give unbiased, unfettered advice to elected officials, like all of these changes are happening and it's happening at a pace, you know, where we see the sectoral changes on top of the global changes we're, we're facing, we're seeing collectively, regardless of the sector we're in. So I think it is, you know, as an association, we put a lot of effort in, and I think, you know, that's causing burnout. I mean, to say that, you know, to say that the last five years have, have we've seen burnout across sectors, I think that's an understatement. It, it's, it, it's been rampant. Um, and so, you know, AMCTO has been, we, we've sort of looked to um, supporting our members and professionals in our, in our sector with things like, you know, our first annual mental health forum. We, we had traditional forums, like a, you know, municipal finance forum, a leadership forum and the like. Well, in, in 2023, early 23, we, we spun up uh, a mental health forum at the request of members who, who wanted to connect with one, one another and have meaningful peer-driven discussions around common issues around pressure, pace of change, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, how that's affecting them, their mental health. And so um, the association is great. We've got really good networking, really good. Uh, that's probably the hallmark of the association is the ability to connect with folks that might be working through similar challenges as you uh, and working through that pace of change that you referenced, Ian. We've, so we speak to people across the country and what you've outlined here are fairly similar topics to what we see elsewhere as well. Uh, particularly around things like speed of change, the pipeline of qualified people moving up, moving through, moving up. Uh, we've also seen a lot of people talk about, you mentioned regionalization, we're seeing amalgamations of things kind of from coast to coast happening as well. So Absolutely. we're seeing a lot of that change. And the, when it comes to the professionalism in the, um, in the choice of careers that people have been making, some provinces, not very many, have been working towards things like certification for CAOs, for example. I don't think there's anything like that for you in Ontario. Is there a requirement for certification? Well, I, AMCTO is really well positioned. So we are uh, an accreditation body. We, we, okay. can, we we're, you know, under legislation, we're, we're one of those uh, few bodies that does offer uh, accreditation to municipal professionals. We've got three uh, accreditations uh, that AMCTO offers. Um, the CMO certified municipal officer is sort of our, our kind of preeminent one. And, and we're seeing more and more that municipalities are looking for that. Councils, if they're hiring a CEO, are looking for that kind of accreditation. Um, and so, you know, our association has been really um, leading edge in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think those types of accreditation programs all, also help us uh, retain talent uh, in the sector and demonstrate the value of ongoing learning, ongoing development, ongoing education. Uh, and it demonstrates to, you know, when I think about councils hiring CAOs or CAOs hiring senior leaders, it's, it's a nice sort of benchmark that folks can look to and say, you know, with that accreditation, I know that this person brings with them a degree of experience in this sector, you know, talk about dealing with the pace of change. Um, you know, they've got that experience. They've got that under their belt. There, there's a, there's a, there's, I think there's a good degree of confidence when someone comes to the table with that, with that certification or that accreditation. So it's been of great value, I think, to our members. Um, and it's something that, that, you know, those that are new to our sector come to AMCTO uh, to get that municipal administration program, right. that sort of foundational piece, and then potentially move on to some form of accreditation. How does AMCTO deal with uh, the new proposed legislations that the Ford government is introducing around strong mayor powers? Because the city of Guelph, which you work at, is one of the 26 municipalities that just recently got strong mayor powers after the city of uh, Toronto and the city of Ottawa. Uh, does the AMCTO have a stance on these strong mayor powers? And what is the organization doing to sort of ensure that they're properly used and there isn't sort of an overstep in the strong mayor powers. Yeah, I mean, I would say that AMCTO as an association, uh, you know, our stance on it is that um, municipal organizations are complex things. Um, and municipal councils and the communities that they serve and they're elected to serve benefit from having someone uh, in a position, generally a CAO, sometimes called city manager, where there is the ability to offer unfettered, unbiased advice to the elected body. Um, you know, as local government professionals, 
we fully understand and appreciate, and we're not in that way much different from our counterparts at provincial or, or federal levels of government. Um, we understand the role is to give the best advice, the best possible advice that is data-driven, um, rooted in engagement with the community and such, and it's the difficult challenge for councils to take that information and distill it and hear from their constituents and sort of smush all that together and make what is, you know, in, in their estimation, the best policy decision possible. And generally speaking, I think communities across Ontario are very successful at it. Councils across our province are very successful at doing just that. But that process hinges upon the concept of, you know, there is a divide between the political and the administrative. Uh, and so AMCTO has a stance that, that you know, communities benefit from having CAOs um, and the strong mayor legislation, depending on how it's implemented in communities, because there is a continuum in terms of how mayors may choose to implement that. Uh, there's an important place for CAOs. Our association is made up of CAOs. You know, as the name implies, we're the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers. It's not just clerks and treasurers. We're, we're sort of the whole kit and caboodle. And, and really, CAOs play an important role in ensuring that Municipal councils have the best information and, and um, you know, that, that's, that's rooted in data and community engagement to be able to inform decisions. So AMCDO stance is that's an important role, and we need to make sure that we're, we're mindful of that as well. I want to talk about the province as a whole, because you represent, uh, you're the president of the organization that represents not only small but uh, large municipalities, but small municipalities as well. When you're talking to your members, are the issues that you're hearing in Guelph or in Burlington or in Kitchener or London the same issues as in uh, Lindsay, Peterborough, like smaller rural communities as well when it comes to municipal administration? Because I'm seeing a staggering trend where there's a lot of vacancies in administrations in smaller communities compared to larger cities because that's where the residents are. Are the, is this a concern for a, a AMCTO? And how do you as an organization sort of help smaller municipalities deal with the vacancy rate for administrations in their communities? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. And um, yes, it's uh, there are very many issues that affect all the municipalities in the same way, but there are yeah. certainly ones that are geographically focused, lo more, more local in nature, more rural than urban, et cetera. But you know, generally speaking, there's a really useful adage that we tend to tell other orders of government when they're developing legislation, policy programs, and the like. And that is that one size does not fit all in our sector in Ontario. Uh, and that's especially, that, you know, that's true across the, the country, I believe, and, and could be the case in Manitoba or Alberta or Saskatchewan. But it's especially true here in Ontario, where we have 444 municipalities that have their own characteristics, their own demographics, their own geographies. Again, I mentioned some are northern, some are southern, some are rural, some are small, medium, large, you know, the whole, it runs the whole gamut. So um, it's also the case too, that there's different internal structures too, right? Different levels of staffing, different abilities to action things or the resourcing available. Um, in some places in Ontario, it's not uncommon to have you know, only a handful of, of staff that are working inside uh, and the majority of folks are sort of outside workers, your public works or your recreation and culture teams. Um, so through the advocacy work that we've done in our programming, we try to put those different lenses on the things um, and obviously leverage our, the strength of our membership to, to sort of understand and, and better be able to advocate with senior levels of government. Um, you know, issues like financial sustainability impacts all municipalities in Ontario. Uh, there's limited revenue resources, and that's, again, not unique to small or, or, or uh, large or rural versus urban. Um, we have services uh, and programs to provide uh, that need to be fun funded and financed. And, and I think financial sustainability and those limited revenue sources is one of those areas where we all struggle. All municipalities have infrastructure and other assets that need to be maintained. And, and you know, balancing the service costs with fiscal responsibility is something I think we all face. Um, where there are issues that we know there's consensus from the members in the association, we define those and, and look to figure out a way in terms of advocacy around those issues. So um, last year, for the first time, AMC2 defined what we called an issue profile, which is a set of objectives and sort of policy statements or areas of interest for our members. Um, and we approved that through the board of directors. And, um, you know, through that, that, that uh, issues profile, we're able to sort of point to ideal solutions that we would like from a policy or a program perspective from senior levels of government. So um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There's certainly some things that are consistent through us all, but there's a handful of other areas where 
um, it can vary quite drastically. You're very passionate about the association by the sound of it. Um, how do you convince other people to join? If you've got 444 municipalities, 2,200 members, there's probably a few people out there who still aren't members. How do you get them in? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I am passionate. I will say I started through that internship program mentioned okay. earlier. Yeah, right. So my start in this in this municipal world came through AMCTO. So I am I am a I am a, I am a fanboy <laughs> to say <laughs> the least. Uh, uh, no doubt about that. I think some of the things that we we do to attract folks is um, you know exactly some of the things we talked about. So working with post secondary institutions to attract the next generation of talent right. to the sector because of some of those generational statistics that I just mentioned. So that's one piece. Um, we talked about the challenges that the sector faces that are uniform across. So Chris asked the question, like you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different challenges that different parts of the province face. One size does not fit all, but there are these sort of consistent challenges. You know, the financial sustainability is the one piece that I mentioned. Well, we can sell the association and we can we can promote the association to to you know folks in the sector or coming into our sector because we we have a we have the ability to say you know our our focus on advocacy is around some of those shared challenges um, and the recent legislative changes and how you're working through those things you know go to go to an association like AMCTO to get that those resources to network with your colleagues so that's certainly a, a really strong position that AMCTO can have to sort of encourage membership the accreditation piece i talked about right what better way to sort of stake a claim to say you know i'm i'm experienced in this world that is local government because i've demonstrated that through a formal accreditation right so um you know there's, there's lots of avenues in which i think we can we, we continue to, to grow the association from a membership standpoint um and we we you know we can share the value that this association brings and those are just some of the examples yeah thanks very much so I want to end on this question because I am cautious of time and I know you're a busy man. So I want to end on this question and I want to want you to put on your timekeeper's time, time hat and go into the future five years from now. You talk about the speed of change that the municipality administrations are dealing with right now. But what does municipal administration look like in five years, in 10 years time, according to the AMCTO? Yeah, well, I've talked about, I mean, I'll start sort of again around that the, the the change in the workforce and the labor market. So I talked about you know some of what our survey data shows um, in 2022. More recent to that, uh, the firm that some of your listeners might be familiar with, the Strategy Corps, they identified that recruitment and, ten, and retention was the top issue that was keeping CAOs up at night um, because what they called was sort of termed a, you know the war for talent or, uh, or or you know the challenges of addressing the upcoming retirement of of, of uh, generations that are leaving the workforce. So. That for me is one that I think will be consistent for the next five, maybe more years uh, is addressing that challenge. Um, I think, again, I come back to our association, we're in a really good spot to be able to support and grow the next generation of, of um, municipal employees that are coming into our sector. Uh, we're gonna continue to advocate for things like that internship program. I think that's really, really key uh, to, to demonstrating that this is a desirable line of work to be in. And it's rewarding because you can see the fruits of your labor in the community that you serve. So that's really key. The financial sustainability piece, you know, limited revenue resources. Um, I think I think there needs to be a, a, a we believe the association and I certainly do as well, that there needs to be, uh, you know, a really conscious and deliberate discussion around that recent changes uh, to development charges and other fees that are part of, you know, how we budget for things at the, at the local level is changing. Um, and, you know, a, a sister association, association of ours on sort of the elected side, uh, AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, had an early estimate that it would cost at least, I think it was $5 billion in the change, in the range of $5 billion uh, over the next nine years to deal with some of the changes we've seen around development charges. So I think that's something that is going to last unless it's addressed. Um, you know, if you if you read the likes of an Enid Slack or folks like that, they've been they've been impressing upon this challenge facing our sector for a long, long time. Uh, and so I don't think that's changing. Um, and then we talked about it briefly, you know, that the impact of, of uh, provincial decisions uh, and decision making on on processes and things that, that that focus on municipalities. So the strong mayor legislation that came through Bill three, uh, the Bill 23 that before that, the brought the brought uh, the brought planning change or changes to the planning system, in Ontario. Um, we're waiting to see what's happening around the dissolution of of the region of Peel, uh, and 
and potential upcoming reviews of other regional governments in Ontario. Um, you know, we saw the the uh, the introduction of a regional review in twenty shortly after the twenty eighteen provincial election here, and that was sort of put on hold for a while. And then with this new uh, new mandate of the provincial government, we're seeing sort of more changes there. So there's a lot of uncertainty around those areas. And despite all those things, the pace of change might feel different, but it's no different than you know regionalization that happened in the sixties and seventies and amalgam amalgamation that happened in the late nineties. So we've seen these changes happen and we've seen municipalities continue to thrive. And most importantly for our association is we have members that are working in communities across the province that are passionate, they're, they're deeply involved in their communities, they're keen to see their communities thrive and succeed. And so for me, I think that municipalities are the places where people come to drive our economy nationally. Um, it doesn't matter if it's small, rural or large urban, um, you know, positive, positive things happen in communities and folks that want to enter this sector can have a really boots on the ground front row seat to those positive changes that happen in municipalities around the province by by finding employment in these places and working in the communities uh, that, that they that they that they live in and, and so there's a lot of really positive things happening in our sector uh, you'll never go a day of work without feeling engaged or stimulated um, i would challenge folks that want to work at senior or federal levels of government that you can do that, uh, but you're never going to see the speed at which the decisions you're working on or the programs and policies that you're working on will be implemented. It might see the light of day, it might not, but if you're working the local level and you're a parks planner, well, in six months, there'll be a shovel in the ground and kids will be playing at that park or playground that, that you worked on. So that's the really fun, fun aspect of this. Um, and Canada's growing, Ontario's growing. So what better place to be at the front row of, of supporting that growth and development than, than at the local level? Stephen, we want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to sit down and talk to us about the AMTCO and also municipal administrations in the province of Ontario today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Stephen. So our full interview with Stephen will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick break. So Ian, another episode down, O is for Ontario. Great interview with Stephen. Three great stories from Ontario, from uh, Nova Scotia and Manitoba. It's always a great pleasure to chat with you. Thanks very much. So O stood for Ontario, O stood for Nova Scotia, and O stood for Manitoba. Is that where we're going with this? Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was great. It, yes, it's it's always fun to talk to people who are passionate about the sector, just like you and I are, and to follow all the news about what's going on around the country, too. So, yeah, it, it, that was a lot of fun, Chris. So this is our last episode until September. September 6th, we'll be back with P for policing. Uh, we're hopefully going to be sitting down to talk to someone about policing in Canada. But before we do that, I will always ask you, what's on the agenda for the next month for strategic steps there, Ian? Unfortunately for us, my vacation is done. Well, maybe not unfortunately for us. Unfortunately for me, I've uh, been and gone. So now it's getting back into things um, starting up again for the new year. We find that a lot of a lot of local government administrations through the summer are prepping for fall because the councils don't sit as much through, through the summer. So there's a lot of that, of course. And, uh, and we start to look at fall as well. There's not a lot going on in terms of local government elections this fall. So we're not, uh, we don't have any um, orientations going, but we've had quite a few inquiries on things like midterm elections kind of halfway through because um, Saskatchewan, I think, actually even goes to the polls next year. So they're coming up against it in the next 14 months anyway. That's what's up for us. And for us, we're hitting the road. We're going to be crossing uh, the country, driving from Calgary to Ontario and well, actually to Quebec. And we're going to be chatting with some of these great uh, counselors that we've been discussing on the show, but also talking with some of the great administration that we have across this country as well. Um, so again, if you have stories for us, send them our way. We'd always like to hear from you. And until then, we will see you in September. Ian, always a pleasure. G is for goodbye. <laughs>